Hey, good afternoon. Excited to see people sticking around on a Saturday afternoon. Um, we have a really interesting conversation today. I know there have been a lot of conversations about AI this weekend. I think that's great. I know there have been a lot of conversations about media and trust in media. And in some ways, what we're here to talk about today is really blending um, uh, some of those aspects together and to talk about trust in, uh, in media. But when I say that in this way, I mean, how can you trust what you see? How can you trust where an image came from? How can we trust where a video has come from? How do we investigate these artifacts in order to gain more information? And what actual solutions are out there? What are people currently doing? Um, so we'll talk both at a high level about you know, what these concepts are, and we'll also get into what people are doing. Um, I'm Ginny Bedanes. I lead the Democracy Forward program at Microsoft. Uh, we do a lot of work around protecting elections, protecting political campaigns um, from cyber attacks. We also do a lot of work around the information ecosystem, what it means to have a healthier information ecosystem and how Microsoft can contribute to that. Um, and that includes a lot of work on the journalism side. Uh, Noreen, who's here, leads our journalism initiative. Um, it also includes a lot of uh, technical work across our different product teams. And so today I want to talk about content provenance, authenticity, and those different um, indicators of trust. We have an amazing panel who are really the experts who will, who will get into those different things. What I'm going to do is have each of them introduce themselves, talk a little bit about what they do, and why they care about this issue, kind of the angle that they're coming at. Um, and I would say we each have different objectives of what we hope for you to walk away with, but overall we hope folks leave this room with a better understanding of what's happening in this space and maybe even um, a sense of how you all can take it home and apply it to what you're doing. So I'll start at the end um, and have Giovanni introduce himself. Thank you, Ginny. Um, my name is Giovanni Severini. I'm clearly Italian. From my accent, uh, I cannot pretend I'm not. <laughs> but I live in the uh, area of Seattle where there is the headquarter of Microsoft. I'm a pure computer science IT person. I'm not a journalist, so sorry if I'm invading <laughs> this space, but uh, um, from a technological point of view, I am responsible of one of the initiatives that we are going to talk about today, that is the content integrity and the solution that Microsoft is going to uh, propose. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Delia Hesham. I am part of the AI and Media Integrity team at Partnership on AI. Um, Partnership on AI is an NGO that focuses on multi-stakeholder guidance and research related to the responsible use of AI. Um, and specifically, I work on the AI and Media Integrity team, which focuses on synthetic media and um, the use of AI in news. So I've spent the better part of the last two years uh, looking at the responsible use of AI in news. Um, and Claire and my manager, along with Christian, have been working really hard on developing guidance related to the use of synthetic media um, and generative AI and how companies can use, can use and develop and platform synthetic media uh, responsibly. Prior to this, I worked in the Ontario government in policy, so I come from a policy background and worked in uh, AI policy mainly. Awesome. Sam. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sam Gregory. I'm the executive director of a um, human rights and civic journalism network called Witness that was founded 30 years ago around the promise of um, being able to show the reality of the world through the cameras that people had in their hands. Um, uh, I sit in an organization that's in a paradoxical moment that um, we use video, we communicate audio visually, but it is simultaneously undermined, um, including by the potential of deceptive audiovisual generative AI. Um, and so um, I work very closely with journalists and human rights defenders who are trying to think how to reinforce the confidence in what they create, that what they film. Um, and we also work uh, on the technical infrastructure that enables that, right? Because it's not enough just to train a journalist or a human rights defender how to, for example, film in a way that is more trustworthy or use a provenance tool. You also have to think about how the technical infrastructure built by big companies like Microsoft uh, and legislated by uh, governments around the world reflects the needs of those individuals. And so what that's meant is uh, for the past 15 years, we've worked on tools for authenticity and trust. How do you trust what you see? And for the last six years, we've worked on how do you, as we describe it, prepare better for deepfakes, 
uh, that's included, um, leading the task force within one of the coalitions that's named here, the C2PA, on threats and harms. What could go wrong? Uh, so that was our job was to look very closely at what goes wrong when you try and think about technologies for trust, as well as to understand how they can enable this level of grassroots journalism. Uh, we also run a deepfakes rapid response force globally that helps people dealing with deepfakes uh, and synthetic media in the wild to handle it. So we work both very in a very grassroots way, but also on the technical standards that are being developed in this area. Okay, so as you can tell, we have some real experts uh, to weigh in on this, and of course, we'll open it up to questions at some point, so be thinking throughout uh, what questions you might have. I'm gonna start actually flipping right back to Sam. One of the things that I know that we encounter when we go and talk to journalists, politicians, you know, generally any person about these concepts, there's a lot of confusion, there's a lot of conflation of terms. You've probably heard people talk about watermarking, you've probably heard people talk about content provenance or fingerprinting or hashing, and a lot of these terms are related but not the same. They're often misused um, and not really clear to people on the other end who aren't deep in this what these things mean. So I was hoping that Sam could start with kind of giving us a lay of the land um, and help us understand what some of these terms mean, how they're used, and then throughout the conversation as we're talking about it, we can of course get a little bit deeper on that. Thanks, Ginny. Uh, and I'm going to use to illustrate actually a graphic that was made by Dahlia's organization, the Partnership on AI. Witness is a partner of Partnership on AI and has been collaborating closely on this. And I think it's helpful because, as Ginny says, this is a term that is very confusing. And it is not only confusing, perhaps, to people in this room, it is confusing to governments and to the press. Um, and as someone who talks to governments and the press, I find there's a lot of confusion on these terms, which doesn't help us make good decisions about what we want what are the trade-offs, what are the risks, and what are the benefits? So that's just to sort of take a step back on why it's so important to get clarity on the terms around what we might call media transparency. And when I say media transparency, transparency can mean a lot as well. Here, it's really understanding where a piece of media perhaps comes from, how it was created, how it was edited. And that might be purely AI, but it also might be at the intersection with what we might call real or captured in the real world content rather than synthetic content. So. Um, let me start to unpack this a little bit. And, and the other thing I'd say to start with is just to name that we're talking about the nature of production here and the nature of participation in that production. We're not necessarily making a judgment here about true or false, right? This is not about true or false. This is about the nature of production, most of these measures. So um, let me start, I'm realizing behind me, I hope you can see this. Um, yeah. You have um, watermarking, um, and let me just... Actually, just start a little layer up. Sorry, I should have had this in front of me. Now I'm trying to remember it as we talk. Um, so the first thing to talk about is a lot of the emphasis at the moment focuses on what's called direct labeling. And you'll see that in the, the top of the chart. And this is really where we're used to understanding AI in the content we consume. So think of when you've seen a made with AI label on something or something maybe in the corner of an image that says, you know, the logo of a company that produced it. And that's by default, a lot of what we've had so far as a way of saying AI is being used. And a number of companies are now saying you need to do this if you use AI tools. The problems we all know are, uh, are often our eyes glaze over when we see labels and we skip over them because they're too generic and they're also easily cropped and removed uh, visibly and audibly, right? So um, it's what we do now, but it's probably not sufficient to move forward for the nature of the content we're working with. So I'm going to move to what's called indirect disclosure. And the way to think about this is direct disclosure is you see it straight away or hear it straight away. Indirect disclosure requires some kind of machine readable, some kind of intervention to read a more rich data set there. Um, and so starting on the... <laughs> it's so confusing for me. I'm so <laughs> visual and I'm being totally thrown by this. So infra indirect disclosure is... There we go. Is providing information on the origins, the how, potentially the who of how something was made in a machine readable way. And it is a proactive addition of information. And again, this is another distinction here. You can see kind of grayed out on the right, there's a whole category of activity that is working out after the fact whether something was made with AI. So this is all about things you do as you generate a piece of AI media. So imagine pressing on your Adobe Firefly or Dali or Mid Journey, you create an image. It's something that happens at the moment of creation, not something you try and guess after the fact. So there you've got these three categories here. 
So watermarks is something you add. It's typically an imperceptible adjustment to the content, a very small adjustment that you can detect afterwards. And so an example of that would be synth ID from Google. Watermark is the term everyone uses, but it's the one that only describes really one part of this. The second thing which we might describe is metadata, right? And so everyone's familiar with the idea of metadata as what you have, you take a photo, right, EXIF data, right? So that's like, you know, camera model, date, time, maybe location if you chose to add that. And so we're all familiar with that. What is the, the addition that we're talking about now is um, a type of um, secured metadata. And I know we'll talk about this later. Um, and so this is rich data that is cryptographically signed, that is attached much more securely to a piece of information, and that is adapted over time, right? So for example, I might take an image, I might edit it with an AI tool, I might use a manual edit maybe to remove an element from it, right? Like sort of shows you the trajectory of information about a piece of media. And then the final thing is fingerprinting, um, which again, we're probably most familiar with the, the way maybe to think about it, something like YouTube's content ID, right? Which is a tool, for example, for a company to be able to match a piece of imagery or a piece of video or audio to something similar, or Shazam, right? Like think about it when you put a pop music song in and it identifies it. And if you do fingerprinting, sometimes you do an exact match, sometimes you're looking for something that's not quite an exact match. So basically what we've got coming together now is these three tools that help you understand how, who, maybe, um, the context of how a piece of media is created, and people are looking at how to combine these all. Thank you. And there are pieces of that that we're going to keep coming back to throughout the conversation. That grayed out area is one that I know is of great interest to people, which is sort of the detection side of it. So we'll talk some about that as we move forward, too, and where how does that play a role? What is complementary here? Um, how are these actually used in the real world? But I want to shift to Dahlia to talk a bit about the synthetic media framework that um, PAI has created because a lot of it is, okay, this is great, but what are the platforms doing? What are the commitments around this? How is this actually being implemented in the real world? And what are kind of the frameworks within which the ecosystem is thinking about um, their responsibilities and what they should be doing? So I thought we'd give her a chance, uh, if it's all right, to talk about that work and how it applies uh, to the real world and to journalists as well. Uh, happy to, thanks, Jenny. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, the framework was launched early last year in January, uh, the Synthetic Media Framework, and uh, the QR code behind me is an easy way for you to access it, be able to read it on your own time afterwards. Um, but it was the result of about two years of work uh, that was put in to bring together all of um, you know, the, the stakeholder community that we were aiming to serve, whether it was the creators of uh, synthetic media, um, the companies that were platforming it, um, the creators that were using it, kind of bringing everyone across the board, academics, um, you know, uh, folks in civil society, um, folks like Sam from Witness who played a huge role in kind of informing the work that we did um, on the uh, synthetic me media framework. Um, and asking kind of the right questions about what are we trying to do here? What does putting together, um, you know, a, a framework, a set of rules around how we ought to disclose the use of synthetic media look like? Um, and at the end of that time, we ended up with this framework um, that really addressed every um, set of actor throughout this entire process. Um, it included, you know, um, guidelines for the builders of this technology it included guidelines for uh, the distributors of this technology platforms that make it easy for you to access synthetic media and it inc included um, a set of rules as well for the developers of the technology. So it kind of addressed the entire pipeline uh, from the beginning uh, inception of uh, synthetic media to uh, the very kind of last bit of it where it reaches audiences and they are interacting with uh, synthetic or generated media and everything in between. And um, the idea was not just to launch uh, a framework or a set of rules, but through this process and because it was so collaborative in its entire kind of inception, uh, we were also able to bring on board 10 partners that were willing to put to work that framework. Um, and those partners are listed, I think, at the bottom, uh, you can see them there. It included Microsoft, it included OpenAI, included TikTok, it included Bumble, um, which a lot of people, when they think of synthetic media, don't really think of a dating site as like a, a user of synthetic media, but there is actually a lot of application of how 
um, synthetic media applies in a setting like that. It included, um, you know, uh, newsrooms like the CBC and the BBC and um, civil society organizations like Witness. And, and so you can really see kind of the breadth of the organizations that were involved in um, creating and in testing out this um, synthetic media framework. And um, the, the idea was to kind of address all of these different ways of disclosure that Sam talked about. Um, to really be able to talk about what does direct disclosure look like, what might indirect disclosure look like, how should each company kind of create its own set of guidance within, um, its, within the company or organization to think about disclosure in its own way. Um, and the idea was to come back a year later and for each of our partners that had agreed to use the framework to come back and say, here's an example of how we put it to work. Here are all the ways it worked for us. Here are all the challenges that we faced when we uh, tried it out and here are the gaps that you need to address in further iterations of this framework. So it wasn't kind of meant to be a one and done exercise of like, hey, we've created the solution. We know um, how it works and you know, let's pack it up and go home. It's a, it's a living document. It's something that we're really working to iterate on. Um, and if you're interested, if you kind of open the framework and go to the last, um, web page in that framework, you'll find all 10 case studies of how each of these organizations have used uh, the framework and uh, what their experience was like. And, and maybe later on in the panel, we can talk about some of these examples of uh, what it meant to put the framework to work um, and how that disclosure actually plays out in real life in the products that are being created and the technologies that are being used um, to create synthetic media. And um, ever since, we've actually had eight more partners join. So now we're at 18, and we're hoping to kind of continue to produce those case studies and really be able to talk about the real life applications of um, synthetic media and disclosure. Before we move on, I'm actually going to ask a follow up because I noticed the BBC is one of the members, and therefore I assume they have one of these pilots. Is there anything you can give from a high level of how they engaged with the, with the format, just because being a media organization, that might be relatable to some of the folks in the room? Sure. Um, so the, the BBC and the CBC, um, both of them have very interesting and very close uh, case studies of how they were thinking of using synthetic media. For the BBC, it was for a um, segment that they were doing uh, talking about addictions. And so they wanted to tell real life stories of um, addicts who are in recovery and um, do some storytelling about what their kind of journey was like. Um, but obviously they wanted to keep their identities anonymous. And so instead of kind of doing the, what you normally see is the blacked out version of a person telling their story with their voice kind of being a little robotic, what they decided to do is to replace that with a fake image of who they were, um, obviously disclosing to the audience at the onset of the segment that what they were about to see weren't real people and weren't real names. Um, and then every time that person appeared on screen, they had like a label that said, hey, this is not the real image of a real person. This is like a replacement of who they were. Um, and they found that people were fairly receptive to that. And the reason they specifically did it in this instance with um, folks facing addictions was because they really wanted to humanize their stories. They didn't want them to be faceless and nameless. They wanted to be able to really bring that story to people and for them to relate to these stories. And so they elected to use um, synthetic media to be able to do that storytelling. Conversely though, CBC um, wanted to do something similar um, for some of their stories that they were, that they were um, relaying to their audience on um, online dating scams, I believe. Um, and they also wanted to use synthetic media to anonymize the uh, people who were, um, you know, who were scammed because it's embarrassing and uh, people don't often want to disclose that that has happened to them. Um, but they actually ended up electing not to uh, because they figured out that, you know, people were used to the format of anonymizing um, people's faces and the robotic voices. And they felt like if they were to put synthetic images there, um, people might kind of um, 
not be able to tell the difference between what was real and what was fake. And they at the CBC also felt like they didn't have, they hadn't spent enough time with the technology themselves to really figure out how it worked and if it would work for them in a way that made sense. So ultimately they ended up deciding not to use it. So it's interesting to see how like two media organizations ended up landing in a very different kind of decision matrix, even though they were trying to do something very similar. Thank you. So the BBC's example is one of using direct <coughs> disclosure, right? They used labeling yep. in a more traditional way. Um, but Giovanni, you and your team, you're an engineer. Um, you noted you're not a journalist. Um, you're an engineer and you spend time working on one of these indirect disclosure methods, in particular the C2PA standards, um, often referred to as content provenance. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what these standards are, how they can be applied, um, and then how folks in this room might be able to think about them in a sort of approachable way, because I know that it can be a little bit intimidating. Yeah. Yes. Um, Sam mentioned a couple of technologies. Those are proprietary technologies. There is nothing wrong with proprietary technologies. Microsoft is the master of the proprietary technologies. But we believe that if we want to extend the, tr the transparency of the digital content uh, to the vast majority of the people on the planet, we should not use a, a proprietary technology, but we should rather use a technology standard. And standard means that it, it, it can be read and recognizable by anyone at any time in any place of the world. Um, now, yeah, technology standards can sound a little bit intimidating, but uh, we can relate to it very easily. You are all connected to Wi-Fi in this room uh, with your um, phone with your laptop and you can connect you just put user and password regardless the brand of your phone and regardless if your laptop is Windows as I hope or <laughs> Mac OS or, or, or Chromebook or whatever and this is possible because there is a standard which is the Wi-Fi standard so there is an organization, a third party organization that studied a technology standard called Wi-Fi and all the uh, uh, companies in the world adhere at that standard and so you can use Wi-Fi. And I can say exactly the same for the 5G. You can connect to 5G regardless of the brand uh, and the operating system of your phone because 5G is a, a technology standard. And Bluetooth, and you can, con you can connect to your mouse and your keyboard, your earphone, to any type of device that you have thanks to the fact that Bluetooth is a standard. So what we are talking here is technology standard that can be accessible by everyone. A standard, to be a standard, needs to comply to two main concepts. One, it must be open. Open, it's very easy. It means that everyone can, assess, can access sorry, to those technology specifications for free without buying anything, without a specific subscription. Everyone for free. This means open. The other concept is a standard must be interoperable. It must work regardless the technology that implement it. So the standard that we decided to use is a standard that is open and interoperable and it's called uh, content credentials and it's governed by the Coalition for Content Provenance and Authenticity. The acronym is C2PA and the website is c2pa.org. It is a standard de facto because it's now used or recognized by mainly all the big techs most of the media and most of the advertising um, uh, companies. Just to give you an example, in the uh, steering committee of the C2PA, uh, from a technology point of view, there is Microsoft and Google, so at the moment the two largest AI organization in the world. There is the BBC from a media point of view. There is Publicity Group, which is the largest, I think, uh, advertising group in, uh, um, uh, in Europe. And then as a member, there are hundreds and hundreds of organizations. Uh, OpenAI, Meta, all of these recognize the C2PA standard today. So it's a standard de facto. What we have done, we have um, created, 
my team has created a solution that allows uh, uh, users to attach this standard to the digital content. Uh, when I say digital content, I mean pictures, videos, audios, and PDF. This is for us the digital content. But also we have implemented a verification site where literally everyone can upload or can link a digital content. And if that digital content has been signed with the standard, then the user can see all the life cycle, all the, all the metadata as Sam was explaining, uh, uh, if it has been tampered or manipulated and so on and so forth. Um, so the standard allowed us to give transparency and to allow everyone to see the origin and the life cycle of a digital content. That's great. So the, the couple use cases of this standard, and there's lots of different ways that it can be used. Um, it can be used to actually identify when something was created by AI. And that's one of the ways that, while not the intention, I think when C2PA really set out to create the standard, it's actually one of the ways that it's been embraced the most. So at Microsoft, if you create an image on um, Bing Image Creator, it will assign C2PA standards at the point that it's created so that it can be inspected as it makes its way onto Meta or onto other platforms so that one would know that in fact that was AI generated. We think this is an important step in the right direction as Sam was referring to. It's important to find a way to indicate that something was created by generative AI. Um, but also one way that we are looking at it is in the election cycle that we are all in the middle of this massive global election cycle and we recognize that the speed with which AI is generating images and videos um, and audio and the rate at which consumers are able to discern what they're looking at, um, it's, it's creating a, um, a moment of uh, anxiety for a lot of people in the media and, and general voters and consumers. Um, a few months ago, we announced that the Giovanni's product will make it available to political campaigns in the US so that they don't have to go and figure out how to apply the standard themselves. You know, they're often not going to have the time or capacity to do that. Um, and so we've got some political campaigns in the US who are now actually applying the standard to all the images and videos that they create as they put it out there. You guys are the first to know that we're actually um, extending that to campaigns uh, and political parties in, in Europe. Um, starting now, yes, we're very excited. Um, and we're also going to be starting a pilot for news organizations. And so if any of you are interested in working with us, we'd like to bring in about a dozen different news organizations who are covering elections, who are in this space, who would like to work with us on using this tool and also considering how they might apply it the right, the right circumstances so that people who you're working with, your consumers, people on the other side of the screen, will know that a video or an image came from you and that it's authentically from your organization. So just a small pitch for that. We're really excited. We'll have more information about it. Um, you can also, if you're interested, we have a QR code. You can go to the site and sign up if you would like to be considered for this pilot. Uh, we're really excited to work with the media on applying this. But outside of some of those use cases, I do want to shift back to how people are currently using it. I know a lot of the questions I get is, okay, we hear announcements from Meta and we hear announcements from Google and they're talking about labeling, they're talking about these different things. What does that practically mean? So I didn't really prep Sam for this question, but I suspect he's gonna be able to answer it. Could you give us a sense of how people are using these different indirect disclosure, um, C2PA or otherwise, um, and what we can all kind of expect as consumers as we go online over the next few months? What are we gonna see? What's gonna be different? So it's, it's early days still, right? Um, and, you know, the place we are seeing it most is, of course, in, uh, and I think this is a good start, where you're seeing it from um, the major companies like Adobe. So if you look at, like, uh, any Adobe product, for example, released from their Firefly, right, you have embedded content credentials in that that explain to you how it was made. And so I think we're seeing those as the core places at the moment. What I would point to, and this is, you know, the place of excitement where Witness comes into this space from is, you know, the reason we started working in this is really trying to understand how in a much more complex audio-visual environment you defend reality as well. And I think that goes to kind of your um, um, note, Ginny, about elections, right? In an election cycle, right, you need to defend of course, you may use AI as part of your work, right, as to engage your consumers, but you also may want to defend the authenticity and credibility of election communications and other things. And so the place that, as witness, we've seen people deploying these solutions is exactly in the front lines of journalism and human rights defense, 
uh, where they are trying to make sure that they can confirm that something has been created by a human but may, for example, have been redacted or edited. And I think this is where it, the overlap comes into the AI world is I think, and I think it's a real point of emphasis and a strength of approaches like the C2PA approaches, the recognition that we're in a non-binary world in the long run, right? This is not gonna be, there's real and there's synthetic, right? It's gonna be a mixed media world in which there are a lot of interactions. And it's really important in that to be able to communicate that. Um, and, and the use case in which we've seen you know, tools like this, it's very important to kind of think about that nuance is in fact in the real world context. So with authenticity tools and indirect disclosure tools like C2PA and tools built on that, and we've worked with a tool called Proof Mode over the last years, the ability to redact something is really important. In fact, you know, there is an editing process that takes place with human and AI footage. This is not just about like this was created and then it therefore it exists. So I think it's really important to look at that nuance and see how that's happening and to see that reflects the actual ways in which journalists and other people engage with information and we as consumers or publics need to then understand it. Gianni, I want to go to you, but I also want to make sure that you, if, if you are able to talk about the Project Providence uh, application of it for war crimes in Ukraine, because I think yeah. looking at how people are actually able to use this technology in a real world capacity will, will help understand why it's so helpful. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Uh, let, let me first say a couple of things. that. Um, Sam point out a very important uh, topic. We have to educate ourselves and then we have to educate the, the, the citizens to the fact that if I have a question like, is this content original or not? There can be three answers and no more two. Of course, yes and no, but there can be also the answer we cannot say. And this is as important and as the other two. Um, uh, when, when we cannot say, the only thing we can do is there are, there are no information, there are no metadata, we cannot track any origin, so it's up to the final user or the citizen to decide if it's original or, or not. It's a, a mindset shift, but we have we we to, to educate everyone to this. Um, it's also important. Um, I was just going to add, but that's the world that we live in right now. Yes. Like right now, we live in a world where the answer is we're not sure because yeah. you're not getting any indicators from a piece of media. You have to do a lot of research on your own to get there, right? So we're trying yeah. to get to a world where there's more yeses or nos and fewer we're not sure. Is that, does that sound right yeah. to you guys? <laughs> okay. uh, uh, two more things. Um, Ginny did not say, but uh, uh, for this product for election, we are not making any money. We are giving for free to the uh, political parties or, or, or organizations. We're legal. <laughs> uh, so just to be clear, it, at the moment, there is not a, a, an inter a direct interest of uh, Microsoft in making revenues out of it. In the future, maybe, but not now. Um, and, and third thing, um, Sam, in addition to all the companies that you listed, uh, it's very cool, in my opinion, that the three main uh, uh, photo camera producers, Sony, Leica, and Nikon, uh, announced that uh, all the new professional models of their cameras, by default, will use C2PA standard to mark their videos and pictures. And I'm saying this because those are the most used by the professional uh, journalist and, and, and reporter. So back to your question, um, Ginny. Yeah, um, Today we have this product uh, uh, up and running, but this product is coming from a pre previous experience where we provided <coughs> um, journalists, they were both either journalists from important um, uh, publisher or a freelancer, uh, that were in uh, Ukraine at the beginning of the, um, uh, of the war, of the invasion uh, from Russia, and uh, uh, we provide them with uh, a mobile app that could run both on iOS and Android. And um, the mobile app, basically, what it does is if you take a video or a picture with that mobile app, automatically there is the information about the origin. So when the, uh, the picture has been done, where, by who, and uh, it is uh, cryptographically so hard for me in English, this word, <laughs> cryptographically signed uh, with, a, with a, um, a private key and so on and so forth. So um, they made an excellent job in uh, reporting uh, what was uh, happening there at the beginning. 
And one of the result is that uh, most of those pictures and videos now are uh, part of the binder that is produced in order to, um, uh, for the international court uh, to sue Russia against a, a lot of crimes that they have done. So we have already a, a, a result of what of our work is doing. Yeah, it's a really interesting case of war crimes uh, evidence collection that for the first time potentially takes a little bit of the onus off of the witness uh, because now they're saying, well, there's actually possibility that you could put a little bit more credibility behind images. And we'll see. Obviously, it's a first use case, and um, we'll see how it works out in the, in the ICC and elsewhere. Um, Dahlia. What, when this conversation is underway and you're talking to journalists, because I know you have a whole program that you lead where you work with journalists in newsrooms, how much of this question is being asked? How much are people asking about trusting images and videos, particularly from a position of uh, brand protection to a certain extent? We know through our threat intelligence teams, and, and you all know just from living it, that a lot of adversaries use brands like yours to uh, to put out fake media to, to forward propaganda. And I know that's one area where we've heard interest and concern from the media is how do I stop that or how do I get to a point where I can say this isn't me, this is me. So is that something that comes up in your conversations or what are you hearing from the from the industry? I think, I think we're, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we're hearing a, a bunch of different things. I, the conversation started uh, last year where I started hearing questions about synthetic media and it began with how do we tell our audiences when we are using synthetic media whether it's you know in generated written word or in generated pictures or in um, videos that have been edited using synthetic media in any way shape or form how do we communicate that to audiences what's kind of the minimum that we can do. So it's it's it was started off very much so about like direct disclosure. How do we talk to our audiences about this? Um, and it varied from media organization to another where they landed on whether they're going to use synthetic media at all. Um, how that disclosure is going to look like? Is it going to be like a byline um, under the you know beginning of the article? Is it like a label on the picture? And you know all of them kind of started to think through what that direct disclosure piece is going to look like. Um, and then very like what quickly followed is realizing that you might put the label on something or you might tell your audiences that this is synthetic media, but if they're not well educated on what that means, then it becomes very difficult to then translate that into uh, labeling that actually matches what they're looking for and that they're able to you know, authentically understand what that is. Um, and so it, now the conversation I think has shifted a lot more to Part one is how do we educate our audiences about this technology and about disclosure and indirect disclosure, direct disclosure, this whole like dichotomy that Sam kind of started off this panel describing to us. And um, it gets very technical very quickly. And so communicating that to your audiences can sometimes be um, a bit difficult. And that's kind of what we saw even the CBC saying in their like case study that, you know, they elected not to use synthetic media because they hadn't figured out that piece yet of how do we educate our audiences first before we use uh, synthetic media. And I think that that's very admirable on their end to, you know, want to educate audiences first before using the technology. Um, so that's part one. Part two, I think, is, is what you talked about, Ginny, in your question is this idea of um, how do we make sure that when people see content from us, videos from us, that they know it is us and not someone else, and vice versa. Um, and that's kind of where, uh, you know, newsrooms are just now starting to get into that conversation of um, metadata, watermarking, which ones should we use? Um, and a lot of our conversations land into, well, what's your objective? What are you trying to get out of using um, any particular disclosure method? And then we can work our way backwards to what disclosure method work makes sense for you. And a lot of the times the answer is a combination. So it's not like you're gonna find one disclosure method that just makes sense, because even if you work through the metadata or you do the watermarking and it's indirect and all that, you still need that part where you're communicating to your audiences what they're seeing, um, whether it's through labeling, whether it's through a disclaimer at the beginning of a segment or what it might be. And so I think we're still very much so in that phase of, of trying to figure out what customized solution of sorts makes sense for various newsrooms. So I have a question for Sam, but first one thing I want to say, it's, it's so, I recognize this topic is kind of like confusing and a little bit nerdy 
and that's great. <laughs> but you guys are on the edge of something. I suspect in 10 years, pro- hopefully, actually, I'd love to know your estimates on when this becomes sort of the norm. These, term- these terms, these uses of technology, obviously, they'll evolve. But this is going to become the norm for how we interact with media online. We're going to come to expect, as consumers, let alone media organizations, we're going to come to expect levels of uh, almost a defense in depth approach. We're going to expect labels. We're going to expect metadata. We're going to expect watermarking. We're going to know what those things are. Um, that is where we will end up. Just like, you know, maybe 20 years ago, no one would know what the little lock was in a URL, but now we've all kind of gotten to a place where we're cognizant of that and you don't put your credit card number if you don't see that. Even my dad knows that, right? So it's, it's an adoption journey that's going to take time. Um, this is all evolving and moving um, actually quite quickly, but it's also been underway for a long time. But I know that one of the questions I get a lot when we start having this dialogue is, why does all of this matter? Can't we just do detection? Like, won't that just solve it? Can't you just build a thing and we drop a video in and it tells us if it's real or not? Um, why is that not here yet? Why don't we have that solution? And that's a, it's a very complicated question. Um, and once again, I'm gonna hand the hard question off to Sam, who I suspect is gonna answer better than I would. But I'd love to know how you view detection as playing a role in all of this. And you know, is it the panacea? Have we just not figured it out yet? Is, is that where we're all going? What do you think? So we need both. Um, so one of the things we do at Witness is we run uh, this work on deepfakes detection in the wild. So how do you do it if you're a journalist meeting something that someone claims is fake or something is real? And, and we've learned what the technical folks on this know as well, which is it is hard to do this, to do it reliably with things that were created perhaps deliberately maliciously or where someone is just simply throwing out a lie that something was made with AI to confuse people. You often get to like 85 or 90% certainty with it. You may not be able to do that unless you know the mode or the tool with which it was made. Um, You then have to explain it to a skeptical public. So detection is hard, it's necessary because we don't have these authenticity signals and frankly we'll probably need both. Um, So it's not a a yes, no to detection or these disclosure approaches. It's a detection is complicated and probably where we need to invest is making sure folks in this room, journalists and news organizations and civil society know how to do detection rather than trying to assume that as a general public, they're going to be able to do detection. If you try and drop an AI image into an online detector now, it's as likely to give you a false result or not if you do it, say, Google, you know, online detector. So we can invest in detection for journalists and for real trusted intermediaries. The idea around provenance and disclosure is this could be something that is useful to any of us. And, and I want to add, um, as everyone is saying, there is not a silver bullet here, okay? There are so many technologies that have to be used all together. However, the technologies will never solve the problem if we don't raise the awareness and the culture of the people about the checking the origin, not believe in a blind way of what they are seeing. Um, also, just really quickly, I think it needs, like, the, a lot of these technologies will need to be iterative. Um, they will need to evolve just as quickly as the technology itself is evolving. And I think that's kind of where detection itself becomes a little bit more tricky than some of the other methods that we've talked about because um, once you figure out detection, bad actors will figure out how to you know, get their way around it. And so you're kind of always in this like cyclical moment. And I think that's why Sam is talking about the need for investment because it's not a one-time thing. It's a thing that we will continue to have to develop and iterate on and make sure that you know, as the technology develops and as the bad actors get, can figure out ways to get around it, that detection can also kind of keep up with all of that. Okay, we have eight minutes left, which means it is your turn. Um, if you have a question, raise your hand. Oh, we already have one. Okay, right up here. Wow, a lot of questions. Good. <laughs> if you don't mind just saying like a little who you are, just so we have context. Oh, hey. Um, so I'm Sophia. I'm audience director at Metro. It's a newspaper, a national newspaper in the UK. Um, and as well, trying to figure out all of this. Uh, but my question is whether you think there'll be, um, oof, the word just left me, um, a commitment from big tech in terms of we can label it, we can detect it, but will bit big tech do enough to stop the spread and the amplification of this? Because even with the fake news, you could tell it, but it's still, well, like wildfire. So do you think there's a next step 
in this in this work that you're all doing? I'll start as the big tech rep, although I suppose we both can, um, but would love you all to speak up too. Um, so we're in a space right now where, from a timing perspective, there's a lot of urgency around getting some of this straightened out. There's also a lot of regulatory frameworks out there that most of us are have open arms and would like to see happen, but we recognize that governments have process and things take time, and even the fastest governments are going to take a while. So there have been a series of voluntary commitments, which I'm not suggesting is uh, better than regulatory. It's just where we are in the moment right now. Um, there were some kicked off by the White House that did address some of these issues around labeling, but you're getting at more of the prevention point. Um, we participated in a group of, of 20 companies, and now it's grown in Munich uh, a couple months ago where we put together um, a series of commitments, around, we're calling it the Tech Accord, it's really focused on uh, deep fakes in elections, but a lot of what was addressed in that conversation will apply to the use of this technology in other ways as well. It did include an entire section around prevention, um, because as we were talking through what we could practically do, we recognized that if we don't start at the prevention stage and think about what our obligations are there, then it's probably pointless if, for us to talk about the labeling and all of the other pieces. So I'd encourage you all to go look at those commitments. Each of the company, not all of them, but almost all of the companies have since put out more details about how they will actually implement those commitments. I recognize it's voluntary. I recognize that there's no actual enforcement mechanism. Um, but I have been heartened to see that a lot of the companies have talked about prevention. That includes things on the model side for those who are AI creators. And then it also includes um, some aspects for the those who are the distributors. Um, probably not everything you're looking for. It feels like a good step. Um, but I'll, I'll turn to those who might be more skeptical of that approach or have other feedback on it. Um, I, I would agree with Ginny that's a start, but there's a lot more needed. I think the key to think about is that to make any of this successful, even the sort of the disclosure, you need a commitment across the pipeline of AI, right? All the way from the models to the distributors to the platforms. And it needs to be one where we've really got an ability also to understand how people are complying. So you need real transparency around that, which we still haven't got real ability to understand it, for example, as civil society. Um, and, and, and you're right, like we need to place this within a broader context of, you know, how do we think about other ways in which content is amplified online that uh, really don't have much to do with AI or human content, you know, so let's not forget the bigger picture as well. I totally agree with you. Thank you for that question. Another, I see a hand up there. Yeah, sure. I've oh, sorry, I see you. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm Damien. I'm a MediaTek consultant. Uh, for sure, uh, identifying and uh, tracing content and digital content is really important. But on the other side, there's also uh, copyright problems and infringements and um, royalties distribution to the uh, creators. Have you ever, and I don't know, maybe CP2A uh, have done that, but uh, imagine to use another auditable uh, technology to do that. Uh, AKA uh, blockchains and smart contracts to do that. Do you say blockchain? Yeah. So there's been, uh, uh, Sam, you can help me here. Um, uh, there's been a long conversation in the, in the standard C2PA, what to use uh, for this. The main reason why C um, uh, blockchain was not used is that blockchain requires still uh, an organization that takes the uh, accountability of what is written there. And you can imagine having an organization that takes the accountability of origin of the media would be soon a political problem. Who is, who is this organization? Who is this organization doing? Uh, on behalf of who? Uh, what this organization should decide about uh, 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 users around the world? So. Blockchain is not easily, from a technology point of view, there is no problem, but from a political point of view, it's not easily applicable to certification of the origin of the uh, content. So C2PA decided to go another way, which is the certification authorities that are around the world. Sam, you? Maybe in the interest of time, I'll let another question okay. short. <laughs> well, it, we, we can talk offline if you want after this, yeah. Yeah, there, there is another one down there. So my other question was about blockchain, but you kind of answered it. The um, other question that I have is, we're seeing on LinkedIn, for example, a shift towards um, authentication of accounts through persona. Uh, although this is obviously, it's got nothing to do with uh, synthetic content. Do you see a shift towards that kind of certification as well? And does this standard apply to uh, certification of individuals? I mean, obviously we've seen, 
the blue tick having absolutely no meaning whatsoever on X. Uh, and that's also another issue when it comes to authenticity of origin of content. Do you see this potential trend including those aspects as well? Go ahead. <laughs> um, one of the things that I'll say as from a witness point of view, we very much push back on and in the current C2PA specs, for example, there's not a heavy focus on identity. So it's not about authenticating someone's identity. I think that's really important in a diverse media ecosystem that we not focus on tying content to identity arbitrarily. You can add identity if you want to. I think perhaps more promising, and this maybe applies to where you're looking at, and I know some companies are looking at it, it's kind of proof of personhood behind, so is it a human creating something might be a useful thing to know versus a machine as we move forward, right? Which is something that we grapple with with bots. But um, identity, I don't think is central to this necessarily, depending on the item. I would also add that like, I think a lot of the times when we're thinking through the disclosure, we're thinking about threading the line between um, letting people know that something is synthetic or disclosing that aspect of things, but also protecting freedom of speech and protecting kind of political actors and protecting people who want to do satire or art um, and want to remain anonymous. So it's kind of that balancing act between the two. And, and so it's not always necessarily, you know, to Sam's point about disclosing who the person is, but knowing that it is a person, that's maybe something to look into a little bit more, but I think a lot of companies are wary from of focusing specifically only on um, knowing who the exact person is. All right, I have promised our friend here that I would wrap up on time, and that is right now, so I apologize. I should have left more room. Um, we will be not in here because they need to clear the room, but we will be out in the hallway immediately after. Please come find us. Let's have a conversation. We can even like form a little group if you guys want to talk, but we have to leave the room, so we're done. Thank you guys so much. Thank you to this wonderful panel.